Let's continue. Now we'll talk about buffer cache and write ahead logging. Uh, I'll explain what buffer cache is. Uh, we'll talk about replacement algorithm about write ahead log, why we need logging, about check pointer process, and other processes that are related to maintaining buffer cache and wall. <coughs> okay, let's start from buffer cache. <coughs> I already mentioned it. Uh, uh, buffer cache is required to uh, because we have very large difference in operating speeds operating speed of disks which is slow and operating speed of memory which is fast uh, so we have part of shared memory uh, <coughs> which is reserved for buffer cache. When we read something from disk, it goes to buffer cache and stays there. So we can use this information without accessing disks, without performing I.O. operations. Uh, uh, so buffer cache uh, speeds up uh, operating of Postgres very significantly. Uh, buffer cache uh, is just an array of buffers. Each buffer had place, has place for one data page, which is usually 8 kilobytes, plus some additional information. What file uh, this data came from, uh, <coughs> number of page in file, and so on. So it's an array of buffers. <coughs> uh, because it is shared memory, um, several processes can access buffer cache concurrently. So we have uh, locks to prevent uh, simultaneous changing of the same data inside buffer cache. Uh, locks are organized so that it allows uh, concurrent operation, but due to locks, access to buffer cache is not so fast as just access to memory. Um, usually buffer cache is a largest part of memory. Uh, it can be, say, one quarter of all operating memory of your server or about it. Uh, <coughs> but usually databases are large and operating system, uh, operating memory is not so large. So it's common situation that all database cannot fit into operating memory, into buffer cache. And uh, you read data to buffer cache and at some point of time you run out of space and to read another data page you have to uh, replace some existing page from buffer cache. The algorithm is called replacement algorithm. Postgres uses least recently used algorithm which ensures that in data that in buffer cache we have hot data, data that we accessed more, most frequently. And data, data pages which are not accessed for some time is replaced by another data. <coughs> uh, 
process can change data in uh, buffer. Uh, and the uh, changed buffer is called dirty buffer or dirty page. Dirty page must be written to disk before you can replace it. So if you must replace some buffer with another page, we first flush our changes to disk and then we can read another data page into that buffer. Uh, <coughs> buffer cache uh, speeds up work because it allows us to, um, to perform less I.O. operations. Uh, but some data resides in operating memory, not in disk. And in case of failure, power outage or something like that, crash of database or operating system, you lose all data that were in operating memory. Uh, and you lose consistency of your data. So we have to protect consistency. And Postgres uses right ahead logging for it as most of databases. Uh, right ahead log is a stream of records. Uh, before we change something, we construct a log record, which describes our intent. We write that we want to change some part of data page. Uh, and put this record into write ahead log. And then we can change data page. <coughs> and uh, records, wall records, must go to disk, to non volatile storage, before changes of data page itself. That's why it's called write ahead log. So, in case of a failure, we have uh, some information on disk, data pages which are not consistent. Some page may be written at one point of time, another page at another point of time. But we have right ahead log written to disk. And we can read all, all records and replay them uh, to uh, make all changes to data pages. Uh, that not happen to be written to disk. Uh, <clears throat> right ahead log protects all information uh, that can be changed in operating memory. First of all, buffer cache, all pages of tables, of indexes, and also uh, state of transactions because state of transactions are also processed in operating memory uh, and then written to disk at some point of time. There are some um, objects that are not protected by log. Uh, this includes include temporary and unlocked tables. Temporary tables exist only for duration of one session, so there is no point in logging. Uh, and unlocked table, its name says that it is unlocked. It can speed up work with such table, but in case of a failure, you just lose all information in the table. And after startup, Postgres replaces unlocked tables with empty. It, it makes it make them empty. <coughs> Such tables can be useful if you can easily restore, recreate information. For example, you can use these tables in um, processes like ETL, you load data, then transform it somehow, and then put it in uh, permanent tables. So intermediate steps can be done with unlocked tables, and it is it works quicker than with common tables. 
Hmm? Uh, wall files. Yeah. They are uh, accumulating more files and more files. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I will talk about it uh, as, as I will say about it. Uh, <coughs> uh, from performance point of view, while logging is uh, um, resource consuming process because uh, after you issue commit command, uh, Postgres must ensure that all wall records from your transaction uh, is are flushed to disk. So Postgres makes a sync call which guarantees or should guarantee that uh, changes in operating memory goes to disk. Uh, it is rather slow operation. Uh, that's why Postgres can work in another mode, not synchronous mode by but asynchronous mode. In this mode, uh, Postgres doesn't write uh, all records immediately after your commit command. Uh, it writes uh, <coughs> changes uh, in background after a while. In this case, uh, it is more efficient, it is quicker, because uh, Postgres can kind of sync uh, multiple records at once. Uh, but there is some uh, period of time after your commit command when you can lose your data in case of failure. With default settings, it's about half a second. Uh, so if Postgres crashes, say, uh, in half a second uh, from your commit command, you can lose your committed data. But it works more efficient. So you can choose uh, which is uh, better to you. To work at higher speed or to guarantee uh, reliability. Yeah. Yes, yes, that's true. You can switch uh, asynchronous mode for on transaction level. So if you can divide all your transactions into critical transactions and non-critical transactions, you can play with it. Say operations with money, you commit in synchronous mode and messages and chats or something like that in asynchronous. Yeah, you can do it. Uh, <coughs> if you use asynchronous mode, uh, wall records is written by wall writer process. It is one of background processes uh, which is uh, used in Postgres. If you use synchronous mode, uh, records are written by backend which issue commit command. Okay, so uh, we have this uh, right ahead logging. We start up our server and start to work. We change data uh, and after a while something happens, Postgres crashes or uh, other fail occurs. Uh, what number of, what lengths of right ahead log we need to restore consistency of data? Uh, we have to replay all wall records from the very start of our operation because we can uh, read some 
page uh, into buffer cache. Then it is quickly updated, never comes to disk. So we have to replay all all records from the very beginning. It is uh, <coughs> absolutely impossible because it is very large volume and it will take a lot of time to replace them all. So we have a checkpoint, checkpointer process, uh, which periodically r flushes all changed buffers to disk. This takes some time. Uh, checkpoint is not actually a point. It is. It has some length. Uh, after checkpoint is completed, we are guaranteed that all data pages, which were dirty at time when checkpoint begins, are written to disk. So, in case of failure, we need uh, all records starting from the latest checkpoint start. For example, if here we have failure, we don't need all records that were before latest completed checkpoint. We need only these uh, log files. So check, yeah. What causes a checkpoint? Hmm? What causes a checkpoint? At what point does it build checkpoint? No, sorry. At what point does Postgres does ah. checkpoint? It does checkpoint periodically. You can set up uh, size of all files, maximum desired size of all files. If you have this volume, it performs checkpoint. Or you can set up it uh, for time. You can specify time interval. Say you want to run your checkpoint every 15 minutes and it will done it. So it's up to me every to do the checkpoint or it's automatic? It's automatic but you can uh, set up it for different time. Does it write also uncommitted uh, transactions? Data. It writes all, uh, yes, yes, all changed data pages, including uncommitted. In case of failure, you will, uh, Postgres will know that this transaction is no longer running, it is not marked as committed, so it is rolled back, and it will not look at uncommitted data. <coughs> okay, so checkpoint uh, limits size of uh, all files we need to recover and it speeds up uh, recover after failure because we have to replay only a limited uh, number of uh, wall records. <coughs> Uh, so we have here we have wall writer process. <coughs> this is a process which writes uh, all records in asynchronous mode. We have checkpointer process which uh, does the checkpoints uh, and flushes all changed pages to disk. And also we have so-called background writer or BG writer, or simply writer process, uh, which writes on um, changed pages, but not all changed pages, but still some part of them, which will likely be replaced in nearest future. So it runs uh, every amount of time and flushes pages that are likely to be replaced. So that when we issue uh, select and it needs some uh, data pages, 
it will found that data page is already written to disk and it can just replace it with necessary data. It will not need to flush them itself. Yeah, and if some backend uh, want to replace buffer and it is dirty despite of check pointer and background writer, um, then backend, backend uh, flushes this buffer itself. It is not very good from performance point of view because you want to just query some data but you have to write data to disk because you cannot just replace it. But you have to do it anyway. Okay, let's let's see. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> logically, we can think of wall as a continuous stream of records. Uh, each record has so-called log sequence number. It's just a byte offset from the very beginning of the log. It is 64-bit number, so it's virtually unlimited. Uh, and current position we can find with pg current wall lsn function. It gives us this position. Uh, it shows two 32-bit uh, numbers delimited by slash 0 and this one. Let's remember this position. Uh, into PSQL variable. Do you remember gset command? Yeah. So now we have pos1 variable which remembers current wall position. And now we make some activity. For example, I can create table, insert some rows in it. And if I, after that, look at wall position, LSN, I can see that it is changed. Yeah, different numbers. Uh, we cannot do hexadecimal arithmetics quickly, but we can just subtract one number from another and get byte uh, lengths in bytes of all records that were created. We have to do it in uh, this way. Uh, this is position uh, in quotes. And this is uh, type cast. So this string, uh, uh, we convert it to pglsn data type and subtract the same from beginning position. And we can see that about 160 kilobytes were generated to protect our changes from failure. Uh, it's quite big amount of data. Why is it so? Uh, because create table command changes a lot in the system catalog. We have to create record row in uh, PG tables. Uh, also we have PG attributes table which contains all columns of our table and uh, so on. And there are indexes on these tables that we also changed, so on, so on. Uh, that's why operations uh, DDL operations takes quite an amount of wall files. 
this way you can estimate how many how much wall is generated by your server under your workloads in some period of time it is important to uh, configure checkpoint or process at physical level all records are <coughs> stored in files uh, which are often called segments each segment by default takes 16 megabytes uh, and we can find them in pg wall directory in our cluster for example here i have five such files they all are 16 megabytes um, postgres automatically deletes unnecessary wall files after checkpoint is completed and automatically creates new files so you don't have to do something about it just know that it is organized that way yeah on the end of, of, of the new uh, all file yes uh, it does have uh, all, all the space all, all access space yeah yes yes when new file is created it reserves all 60 megabytes at once actually if you have no not many files postgres just renames old file to new name and reuses it to speed up processing there is a lock on the database while uh, the wall file is written uh, wall file is written in one stream so yes there is a lock the database freezes uh, no, database not freezes. No, only for the time of uh, the wall uh, writing. If you use synchronous mode, your background process is frozen while it writes uh, necessary wall records. Other backends continue to operate. And if you use asynchronous mode, nobody <laughs> freezes. Just background process writes. That's all. <coughs> and a couple of words about log levels. Uh, if we use right ahead logging just for recovery from failure, we need some minimum information in it. Uh, we have uh, configuration parameter that is called wall level we can set it to minimal value and wall after that wall can be used only for recovery purposes uh, but by default postgres uh, writes a little more information into wall which uh, allows it postgres to use wall for other purposes as well uh, default level is replica uh, and with this level you can use backups and you can use you can restore your data from backups to do point in time recovery and also you can use physical replication you can replicate your wall records to another server another server can replay them and so another server can be an identical copy of your main server it is very useful and also there is one more level logical it writes uh, additional information that allows you to use logical replication about the log file since uh, every file is uh, 60 meg of uh, yeah. data is it been uh, correlated in the same directory and it's going to have space you know so is there a mechanism to clean it you know once a week or something like that or you have to manually create oh, um, a script postgres deletes unnecessary wall files automatically after checkpoint is completed you know that you don't need some portion of files and it deleted delete them automatically so we don't have to do it 
all you need to do is ensure that you have enough space for your mm, wall files. Uh, up to Postgres 11, uh, Postgres can store, uh, I think, three times more uh, than is required between checkpoints. And now uh, it can store two times more. Yeah. So you, I, I explain, you have to store all uh, files from the latest completed checkpoint plus uh, because checkpoint is uh, prolonged you have to store this information too and Postgres uh, before Postgres 10 it stores information from two previous checkpoints now it stores only information from latest checkpoint so you have you need to have enough space on disk for these whole files okay so buffer cache is very convenient uh, to speed up operation because it reduces number of IO operations but it requires a lot of mechanisms around it to work. It requires right ahead logging, uh, several background processes and so on. But as long as we have right ahead log we can use it in different situations. We can use it for backup and recovery and for replication. Uh, any questions? Yeah. What is the level now of the logical replication? It's relatively new in, in Postgres, no? Yes, it's it's a, a logical level is relatively new. Logical replication period in Postgres 10. And what is the level of it? Is it a reliable, a quick, so on? Oh. We have replication in, in, in SSQL. Mm -hmm. Logical application they use it a lot. It's very reliable and mm -hmm. very flexible and so on. Mm -hmm. How is it in uh, Postgres? Uh, in Postgres, uh, it is reliable, but it is not. It don't doesn't allow you to do anything you want. It is somewhat limited functionality. Uh, the flexibility. Yes, it is reliable, and if you want more mm, possibilities, you can use PG Logical extension. Uh, it's a second quadrant company, uh, which makes it. Uh, and in PG Logical, they have all necessary tools, and they commit uh, their changes into Postgres but it's slow pr process it can take several releases so all uh, I think all you need is uh, PG logical if I have unlogged uh, table uh, uh, does it mean that uh, won't be replicated and uh, I uh, cannot back it up. Yes, unlocked tables are not replicated. You have no wall records, so you can't replicate it. And you you lose your data no after, after crash. But in logical replication or even in a physical replication? Uh, in logical and in physical no way to replicate it. Backup you also won't work. Huh? Hmm? Uh, backup on this uh, table also won't work. Yeah, yeah. 
won't work. You can use logical backup, pg dump, uh, but it's not. I think it's not what you need. Pg base backup cannot deal with it. So just don't use unlocked tables if you uh, if the data has some value to you. <laughs> Okay, practice. Uh, this is not big practice. Uh, uh, the point here is to look how Postgres uh, behaves in different shutdown modes. In fast mode, uh, Postgres terminates all connections, performs checkpoint, shutdown checkpoint, and shuts down. Uh, so after that, you have consistent data on disk. And when you start Postgres, it can uh, start uh, immediately. When you stop Postgres in immediate mode, it doesn't perform shutdown checkpoint. So it's kind of simulation of crash. You have uh, inconsistent, inconsistent data on disk, but you have your whole records. And uh, when you start Postgres, it goes into recovery mode. It replaces whole records and recover from this failure. Uh, try to stop Postgres in both modes and look into message log to see how Postgres uh, informs you of what it is doing in both these situations. Uh, let's start the next topic uh, in 15, uh, 15.